everyone to tonight's episode of Profound States. Tonight we have a very special guest. His name is Alan Steinfeld. Um, he's an author and an explorer of consciousness, of consciousness. For over 30 years, he's hosted and produced the weekly television series, New Realities on Manhattan Cable and uh, YouTube with 82,000 subscribers and over 22 million followers. His YouTube channel is youtube.com slash new reality realities R E A L I T E S. His new book, uh, Making Contact The New Realities of Extraterrestrial Existence, features original writings by Me uh, Linda Moulton Howe, Willie Strieber, Daryl Anka, John Mack, Mary Rodwell, JJ, and Desiree Hertak, uh, Hertak uh, Grant Cameron, Carolyn Corey, and others. Has also produced two films on the subject, Hidden, The Hidden Hand by James Carmen, and Calling Our Earthlings about George Van Tassel by Jonathan Berman. He feels that only when the inner explorations of the soul are combined with the outer adventures of the mind can we achieve a harmonious understanding of our place in the cosmos. Welcome to tonight's show, Alan Steinfeld. Thank you, Charles. Um, Charles, huh? Well, I go by Mike, but you can call me Shirley as long as you pay me enough money. All right. Well, I'm not going to pay you to call you any names, but uh, I mean, it says Charles, but I thought your name was Mike, but your thing says Charles right here. Well, my full name is Charles Michael Beaver. Uh, by the way, you mentioned uh, your bio mentions, uh, who was it? Oh, God, I, I don't have it on the screen again. The uh, the Van Tassel, yeah. Oh yeah. Did you George did, were you were you around when he was alive? No, 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 no. My friend Jonathan uh, heard about him and the Integratron, and he said this is a fantastic story. How come no one's ever done a film about it? I mean, there were little documentaries and all that, but he actually sat down and did this film about calling all earthlings, which was fantastic sort of sort of theme there. And you know the story of George Van Tassel? Uh, do you know? Um, if he's the, okay, so there's two or three people that did what he did that I may, you know, I'm not sure if I'm confusing them or not. Is he the one that had the, uh, the meetings at the Red Rock, the, the Big Rock? The giant rock. He had right. Meetings. Yeah. He had okay. the first UFO meetings, I think, in maybe it was 1954 was the first UFO meeting out by giant rock. Well, there was a lady I interviewed who went to those meetings when he was alive. And she uh, mentioned that she while she was there, she saw um, Howard Hughes land his plane in his, outf his white outfit, got out went over, talked to, uh, to Van Tassel and handed him a check. She saw him hand a check to him. And um, yeah, those, that's an interesting area. Well, well, George Van Tassel worked as an um, aerospace engineer for Howard Hughes until he, um, I, I guess he quit or something. He got really caught up with ET visitation and higher consciousness. And I don't know, I guess maybe um, Howard Hughes was supporting those those endeavors because uh, there was a landing strip out there. Howard Hughes was very interested in the mystical. I mean, I've heard stories about him going to different vortex sites around the planet. Um, they called him the Americana when he went to the south of Spain, and um, he he was very much interested in. I mean, I guess not that many people know that about Howard Hughes, but yeah, there's sto legends anyway. Well, the one of the ladies I interviewed said that she worked. Uh, how does it go? Let's see. Oh no, it wasn't a lady. It was uh, the director. One of the two directors of South Southern California Mufon said that his mother told him when he was five years old that she would uh, go out to the desert. She was working for Howard Hughes. She got to the desert. She go into deep underground military bases working for Howard Hughes. 
Yeah, I think Howard Hughes may have even been, I mean, I don't know the inside story. I mean, and Howard Hughes was just very tangential to the Van Tassel story. But I would say Howard Hughes supported a lot of what um, Van Tassel was doing in, in creating the Integratron, which came to him um, under the direction of ETs to build this time machine. And so it's out there. It was never finished. He mysteriously died right before it was finished and all his papers were taken. I mean, maybe Howard Hughes was a double agent. I don't know. I can't say that. I'm just making that up. But um, something weird happened to Van Tassel. I don't know what what Howard Hughes' story was, but he was a little odd himself, so they say. But yeah. Well, uh, so let's get into your story. So. Yeah. What's the very first odd thing that ever happened to you in your life of any kind? <laughs> thanks for thanks for asking those questions. I would <laughs> say, um, I would say that I think I had attention deficit disorder. I could not fall asleep at night. You know, children put put to bed before it's dark and can never sleep like that. And um, let's see, I would see faces at the window. Maybe every child does that. And then in order no. to help. Oh, no, they don't. They don't? Oh, they don't. To me. But um, thank you for saying that. But in order to help myself fall asleep, I, at like two years old or something, maybe it was three or two or three years old, I developed a meditation or I didn't know it was a meditation. I closed my eyes and looked straight ahead. And it was like I saw the white light. I mean, I'd go into these white light meditations at two years old just to cure my hyperactivity, not to cure it, but to deal with hyperactivity and do a sort of meditation in a sense that, I mean, had no idea that's what I was doing. But years later, I realized, oh, and it's all because I was so, had a lot of energy and, you know, I was just laying there in my little two-year-old bed and and needed to do something. So I went inward instead of outward. So that's pretty advanced for a two-year-old. Well, I didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't doing it to be advanced. I was doing it just to see, okay. I Then I discovered sort of, there's just, there's, we're just as infinite inside of us as we are outside of us. And I can't prove that, but that's what came to me. Well, some people say that if you want to, when you die, if you want to get out of the matrix and stop reincarnating, they say you go inward instead of outward. Some people say that's right. You don't follow the light. You follow, I wouldn't say the dark, but you follow the void. The light reincarnates you and the void, you are absorbed into the totality of all that is. So uh, I don't know if that's true. I, I can't say my last lifetime was not a picnic. I'll tell you that much. You OK, so you've got me curious. Uh, go ahead and tell us about your past life. Do you go in, Are you interested in past lives? I'm interested in almost anything you could talk about as long as it's your original. It's something about you that you have direct knowledge of. Well, I don't know if it's direct knowledge. I don't know if it's fabrication. I don't know if it. Um, some kind of, uh, anyway, I'll just tell you. So it seems like in my past life, I was probably in the concentration camps there in Poland and and remembered running. I still don't like people in uniforms. I remember running and hiding. And how, did you, how did you come up with this past life? How did you get it? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I, I knew I had an inkling of something, but I went to a regressionist and she didn't tell me what it, what it was. She regressed me back. Okay, you're back in some past lifetime previous. What do you see? And then these visions or ideas, and maybe it was my imagination, started coming to me. I, and felt I, don't, real, I, I, felt I, I don't think it was your imagination. I think it was real. I can't say, but it felt real. It felt very emotional. Usually you don't get that emotional just by imagining things. That's what's true of UFO ET abductions as well. 
that people get very emotional when they tap. And I've had those too. And I don't think those people are imagining things either. I think those things are, are, have, have happened. And, and they're so traumatic, just like these past lives, that they're buried in the, in the psyche. But I think there's a part of our mind that has access to all time, all space. Some people call that the Akashic Records. But the, the, the lifetimes you remember are usually the ones that stick out. Like, a, I mean, the ones that have been integrated are great. There's no need to remember them. But the ones that, that still have some processing and haven't been washed away through integration are the ones that create... Um, uh, situations that need to be resolved on a soul level, if that well, makes sense. Um, when I was doing regressions of people, uh, I thought it was kind of boring, to be honest, uh, because when you regress somebody to a past life, they go to a random day on the life, right? And it doesn't necessarily have any meaning. But if you regress, what you find out if you do those th kinds of things is you instead of just regressing them to a random day, you want to regress them to something that has relevance to the current incarnation. Well, that's the person I work with. She goes, um, go to a day where you decided on a soul level, this is always like this or this is never like this. You made a, not quite a contract, but you made a decision that set the course of a sort of psyche disposition and see what that was and see how you can undo it. So it's never a random day, I think, when you go back to those lifetimes. It's always like a critical point where, you know, I, I, for instance, I've come home, my, my family's gone, I know the Nazis are invading, you know, I had to run, you know, it's like those... Well, those. what I did was I would, uh, you know, you, you're, how you, what you do, uh, evolves over time. So what I ended up doing was taking them to the last day they were alive in their previous incarnation, and then I would take them through the death process, and then I would take them through their inner life experience like like um, Michael Newton did, and I'd take them all the way through their inner life experience until they were born in the next incarnation. And I would do that as many lifetimes as I could in, b backwards, and then I would take them forward uh, pass through any knowledge of how they die in this life and then do the exact same thing forward in f future lives. And But focus on what happens between lives is where I ended up focusing. Well, I did that, actually. I did. I went, I mean, just in the past, I went to where I did, you know, the, cons the, the gas chambers and those bodies piled up that you see those awful bodies in the Nazi um, concentration camps. And yeah. I said, well, this really isn't going anywhere. And then I left. And then I remember being welcomed by a star family of beings in between those that life and um, saying, and saying, so this is going to, this next one's going to be good. So, <laughs> so that was Yes. When you were in the concentration camp, did you have the, did, as being aggressed, did you have the wherewithal to look at your body to see what the number was that you had tattooed on you? That's good. No, I, I didn't, but I was too concerned with survival and eating wood chips off the windowsill and and I think I may have been a doctor telling people how to survive the best they can, that I I wasn't directed to do that. I maybe could if I went back there. It's it's kind of well, still the, the only reason I, I, I mention is because if you did that, then potentially if the German records were still around, you could potentially find out the, the name of who you were. And then, you know... That sort of thing. Well, no, that's really interesting. I did sort of get a name, like Joseph, uh, Joseph, or something like that. And I really feel I probably was a sort of doctor there. I mean, 
I mean, I so, could get confirmation, but I sort of feel like I have confirmation. So tell us about the star family that you encountered in between. Well, in between, so I went back, and this only actually happened after, years after. So I leave, decide to consciously leave, uh, and then I'm brought to this planet uh, or someplace. It, it's very vague when you go to those places and welcomed by a group of entities that, or beings, star beings that said, well, that was Heart, like almost congratulated for that intense time and sort of relayed the knowledge of that suffering to these other beings. It's like, it was like a transmission to them of the human experience. That's what I'm getting to say now. So it's like, you know, we're all volunteers here on planet Earth. And so, we're here to spread, in a way, the intensity of the of the density, the intensity of the density to beings that, you know, it's like you can watch television, you could be in the television program. We're right here on Earth. We're in the drama. We're in the suffering, and a lot of beings, you know, may have done that. They may have. Uh, get it vicariously, but we are um, sharing our experiences on the Akasha, whatever, on the soul level with these other beings that are um, awaiting our arrival to learn from our experiences. Right. I, yeah, I, I've heard the same thing, and I'm uh, thinking that the people who come to Earth, or people, or I'm not thinking, Here's what I've heard re most recently is that you don't, this is kind of backwards the way you normally hear. Uh, Earth is supposedly an advanced planet in the sense that if you, um, if you come here, this isn't your first incarnation. That means you've been, if you come here, you means you, you've already been to a, like a fifth or sixth or seventh or eighth density place that's a lot more perfect, that's an easier life. And then you come down here, which is a much more difficult life. So this isn't like an advanced, uh, like a college graduate course sort of, rather than an undergraduate course sort of thing. I, I've heard that, but I've also heard the fact that this is a place for people to experience the first time around. That's why you get people uh, so ego based because they have not evolved around the egoic attachment. So they're here to learn those lifetimes. You ever read the book, The Red Lion? That is a tracking. It's a not. It's a fiction book, but it's a tracking of lifetime after lifetime, which leads um, Earth lives through an evolution of consciousness. But it could also be true what you're saying. Both both may be true. So go to the next, um, after your childhood experiences that you mentioned previously, uh, go to the next th next uh, big experience in your life of any kind. Next, thank you for asking all that. Um, I would have at about, well, I think when I was around 14, puberty sort of at, at time, 14, 13, 14, I would I think it's when my early abduction started. Um, I feel like I couldn't move in the body. I felt like I was being pulled out of the back of my head. I've heard other people I've talked to recently or in the last 10 years talk about being, felt like I was trying to be pulled out of my body and then feeling as if my body couldn't move and also a lot of red light in the room. I think I had red shutters on the window for some reason. My mother had put red shutters on the window. So it was these feeling disconnected from the body and, and doing having to do something mentally to get back into the body. And that probably happened maybe half a dozen times. 
13, 14. I also started to listen to, um, then I had to sleep with the life. I so what, with the life. What, what did you, when you had these five or six experiences of getting pulled out of your body, what did you see after you got out of your body? Well, I actually didn't, that's a good question. I actually didn't see anything. I was just so freaked out. I had to find a way to get back in. And it was like a a lesson sort of like, um, what do I need to do or think to get back in to the body? I'd be pulled out and then. So you're, so, so you're saying the be- whoever pulled you out was doing it just to, just to see if you could get back in. I don't know if that's what happened. I know there was someone pulling me out. Maybe it was a soul evolution. Maybe it was a part of an ancient initiation of 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 fifth dimensional adept technologies. Um, maybe so you don't ancient- you don't pin it you don't pin it down to what was what that. Was- you don't really pin it down. Well, I, I'd like to, but I haven't. I mean, I haven't. I'm just to be honest. I have not pinned it down to what it was, but it was a sort of um, training in the awareness of consciousness. That, I, so, but it did kind of freak me out. So, if you, you know? want to, if you want to pin it down, yeah. just call, just call me. Oh, you, what? What do you mean? How? How are you going to pin it down for me, Charles? I'm Mike. gonna regress you, and we're gonna we're gonna your awareness. Uh, if I regress you to exactly to that event, your awareness, part of you knows what is what caused it. What do you want to just do that now? Uh, we can do we can do it in time whenever when you have when you have more time. All right, all right. I'm interested. We could do it on the air then. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. We I'll record it, and uh, I I there's uh, you know who Terry uh, Lovelace is right. Yeah, I, I've interviewed Terry. I've hung out with Terry. We've been to retreats. Yeah, I like Terry. Okay, so there's a lady up in uh, Canada who has hypnotized him two or three times, and uh, she says that regressing people over Skype is actually easier than in person. I regress plenty of people in person. So if I can yeah. do a good job in person, I can, and it's easier over Skype, then, then we're, we're good to go. Great. Actually, I wanted to ask you something I saw on your website about John Susla. Why, why do you mention him and the case, Landrum case? John, John Schusler? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, okay, so, well, first of all, I have to go back a little bit because I used to hang out with uh, a number of the founders of MUFON. Okay, uh, the one of them was um, the guy that lived in Texas uh, near San Antonio. Uh, uh, I can't remember his name, but I used to hang out with him. I used to go to his meetings, uh, and we we ate at a uh, Mexican restaurant one time. Anyway, Schusler investigated my events. I, I'm a I'm a contactee, so. When when Schusler was when he revealed publicly or when it was revealed publicly that he was investigating the uh, Cash Landrum case. Right. At that same time was when he, I was working with him, like within within two or three years of of that going public, he started investigating my cases and that was my early days. And so he uh, took me to a hypnotist up in. Humble or um, Conroe, Texas, like an hour north of Houston. And this lady was, she worked with police officers and FBI agents and people like that. And they would get paranoid because they were always getting shot at. And they would get stuck in paranoid mind states. And she helped him to try to regress me uh, to get more information about my first two encounters. That's before I got before I started uh, encountering actual beings themselves. That was mm-hmm. my early days, so. Right. Now I'd like to interview you about those early days. Where, where were you located in those early days? Of uh, well, my, my actual events uh, got more interesting than that. Those early days, I had two close encounters with Kraft, but 
it actually got far more interesting as it progressed later in life. Far more interesting. Far more so, interesting in the sense that you met each other. What, what was the interesting part? Not to turn the interview around on you, but I'm interested. Well, it, it got interesting in the sense that, you know, when you're meeting craft and you're communicating with aliens that are in craft, it's not near, near as interesting as when you're meeting them in your apartment. Uh, where was this in New York or in East Coast? Where was this? Well, I'm I'm from Houston, so. Oh, it was out there. Yeah. What? So, no, the only, yeah. Go ahead. No, I'm saying the only reason I mentioned John Schlusler was because it seemed like the um, the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, had quoted a lot of his work with MUFON and finding um, protocols to help people that were injured by, like in the crash and the cash laundrum case, high intensity radiation. And that was actually mentioned in the Senate bill or the congressional bill. Did you did you see that? Well, no? OK, so you know who, um, what's the guy that works at MIT? MIT? Uh, it's either it's either Stanford or MIT, one of the two. Oh, you mean mean uh, Gary Nolan? Yeah. Okay. So he's he's been working on that same thing uh, with people who've had uh, injuries because of of uh, being near craft. Now the Cash Landrum, uh, you know what happened after they had that encounter, right? Well, they got very sick, but well, no, I mean after after it was all said and done, after everything was totally done, uh, what I, happened? I talked to Preston Dennett about that. I don't know if I believe everything Preston says, and he says that there are no negative things from real ET craft. He says that was a government created craft that spewed that radiation onto those people, and it wasn't a real ET craft. Well, I don't know what you think about I'm, that. I'm okay. I'm okay with that that notion but what, what there's one thing about the those encounters that a lot of people don't know besides the fact that neither lady ever worked another day in their life besides okay. the fact that they got permanently sick and injured by the radiation the the extra part that most people don't know is that uh, the government came along and they ripped up the asphalt for like a, a quarter of a mile in each direction or half a mile in each direction ripped it all up, put new asphalt down, just so nobody could come by and pick this, that asphalt and get get readings from it, from the radiation. Well, do you think that was a government craft that was um, reverse Probably. engineered? Probably, yeah. So it wasn't a real ET craft. It was modeled after real ET craft then. Well, it was flying in formation with uh, a, um, a whole bunch of helicopters. Right. So they weren't just chasing after the craft. They were flying all together. Right. That's what, that's what's. So Schlusser, was he aware that it could have been a government craft or did he believe it was an ET craft? Uh, I'm not sure. I never asked him, but I can tell you that uh, I had an interview with. Um, what's the guy's name? He's he's an abductee. He owns his own radio station. Physical radio that station. Is it? Joe, no. Joe Montalda. I talked to Joe. Oh, okay. about, I talked to Joe about uh, Schusler. Schusler still alive, by the way. I talked oh, to. Is he? he is, and I talked to uh, Montalda about Schusler, and he said he's a company man. Always has been. He's a what? He says what? He's a company man. Oh, he's working for the government. You mean CIA? Well. Maybe, but he was the first person to institute health protocols for MUFON saying, and for physicians, right? I'm not, that I'm not, I'm not saying he wasn't a real good person, but uh, I'm just telling you that Montaldo says he was a company man. No, he doesn't, he doesn't equivocate. He doesn't say he might be. I, I don't he know if he, he was, or not, but I think what he tried to do separate from whether he was or not, was tell people there are severe repercussions. He was the first one and created protocols for health practitioners to check when someone claims to not discount 
a contact experience and he says, well, if someone's saying this, look for these sort of indications physiologically. I think he was the first to do that, wasn't he? Well, I, I'm not sure, but I can tell you one thing. I, I would say that the reason why the CIA probably hired him, if, if they did, I'm not saying they did or they didn't, but if they did, was probably because he was a genuine good person and people uh. knew that and understood that. And by the fact that he was that type of person, uh, naturally, he's going to get people to open up to him because they could sense that he's a good person. But he was one of the early directors of MUFON or one of the... Founders, yes. He was one of the founders. Yes, he was. And that may have been uh, a government inside organization originally, I agree. Well, the, the closest... I, I was talking to... Um, I was being interviewed by one lady who um, I just communicate with her today. Can't remember her name, but uh, she wanted me to say to to reveal the the notion that the CIA was in charge of MUFON, and and I wouldn't do that. But I did have one experience with MUFON that kind of stands out, and I'll tell it to you. It's very short. Uh, yeah. I was. I was standing with um, the head researcher for the Georgia MUFON. And he wasn't the head of Georgia MUFON, but he was the head researcher of Georgia MUFON. I was standing with him outside after it was all said and done. He's sitting in his car, and I'm standing with his guy's window open, and I'm telling him my story for the first time. And there was a guy standing uh, there was everybody had left the library, right? It was totally de uh, empty except for me, uh, this fellow, and there was another strange fellow standing outside of his car with his door open, and he was facing away from us with his back to us, like looking, like guarding this person. And he never turned around, not one time, the whole time we we're out there, never moved, or nothing. He was like standing a little frozen, stand, facing the opposite direction. That was one of the weirdest, I mean, it doesn't really mean anything, but it is kind of odd. Well, yeah, no, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of odd things once you dive down the rabbit hole. And um, then you get people like um, Jim Semivan. Where for the CIA, who has these experiences, who who knows nothing about what the other part of the CIA is doing. He's totally well, freaked out. Okay, well, Simi, I've listened to Simi Van talk, and he's got to deal with somebody because he won't give out his actual experience. He'll, he'll talk all around it. He'll say he had it, but he won't actually go through it because he's, in, he's got some kind of movie deal or book deal or some kind of deal going on where he, he will not go through this, the actual experience. Well, he goes through some of it where there was a hole in the back of his neck. These beings appeared. He and his wife were freaked out. She had some something happened to her, which he doesn't say, but he was, I mean, he goes through, he gives some of it away. He, talk, I mean, he talks around it. He talks around it. Around some of it. I think he he had a genuine. But, but here's here's the thing. I have worked for the CIA also. Uh -huh. Okay, but all I did for them was computer geek stuff. That's mm -hmm. it. No, nothing, nothing strange or interesting. But but the, getting back to Sammy Van, he had no idea any of this stuff was happening, and he worked for the CIA. So there's a other undercover branch at the CIA. If you believe him, and I do believe him, I talked to him for two oh. hours. Okay, so you know who uh, Daryl Sims is, right? I just was with Daryl Sims last weekend in Manchester, yeah. So, you know, he he claims he uh, was a CIA man, right? He claims a lot of things. It's hard to know what Daryl and his cowboy hat, so yeah. Yeah, okay, so... Um, I mean, I like he, him, but it's hard to know what to do you know, believe. Do you know exactly what he did for them? No, I do not, actually, no. no okay, tell me. so what he did was... he. See, I've known people around him who know him. Very well. Okay. And he, what he did was, is he was a martial artist. He was a bodyguard. He was a driver. And he drove um, 
dignitaries from different countries around to uh, wherever they needed to go. And so basically he just took notes on those people and reported that information back to either CIA or DIA, one of the two. And that's what he did. Well, but I'm just saying there's parts of the CIA that may be deeply, deeply into this and other parts don't have any clue. I mean, well, the reason why I mentioned uh, Daryl is because uh, one of the things I've noticed from my own research is that the aliens like intelligence people. People who right. work in intelligence itself. Not just people who are smart, but people who worked in the intelligence field. They want people who are um, who are psychically advanced. They want people who have been in the intelligence field. They want traits of unusual people. They don't. So they don't want the the guy that's the uh, the uh, the homeless person on the street that has no knowledge or or sophistication of any kind. Well, what do you think of David Grush, who just came forward, major intelligence person? What do you think of his story? Uh, I don't have any problem with his story. The head of the DOD, the head, the head of the, uh, the DOD, the the head of the the what's the group that runs the DOD within the DOD? The the chief oh, of uh, 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 UAP task force. That no, no, I'm talking about the the head of the DOD. The, the group, they're they're called. They have a name. They're called like the, the yeah, the eight or the nine. There's some head, yeah. They're all yeah. generals. They're like one, two, and three star generals. Right. Those are the ones suppressing the, the cover up. I mean, those are making the cover up, rather. Well, you know what? Uh, what's his face? Um, um. Oh God, the guy that came out that was running the. Uh, Oh, Lou Elizondo, him. Yeah, okay. So you know what he says about the the high ups in the DOD, right? No, what does he say? He say that he says they believe that the the aliens are demons. Yes, some of the higher ups are highly religious, I know. And that's been a problem with the split in the DOD. And uh, other people have said that. Linda Moulton Howe has said that. Other people and then there's other parts of the DOD. That are saying, I think getting kickbacks for selling the, this is just my theory, you know, the reverse engineering um, technologies to private industry. Well, that's how. Um, okay, you know, so let's, let's get into that for a second. So there, yeah. there's, um, I, if you go back and listen to my last three interviews that I've had on my podcast, you'll find out that, um, like Misha Johnson, Misha Johnston is one of them. Uh, Denise Stoner is one of them. And I forgot who the third person is. But Denise. they all um, correlate that, um, like, for instance, the secret space program. I didn't believe in that. I was totally uh, not believing that at all. Okay. Misha says she's a secret space program person. And when I went, I used to go to her groups and um, and I've noticed there will be like 20, 30 people in this group. More than half of them claim they were secret space program people. Now, if everybody was lying about that, you wouldn't think that it would be more than the majority of people. Well, my theory about the secret space program is that these could be um, screen projections by the ETs of military type to to make people think they've had military abductions and secret space program. But I don't I have a hard time with the secret space program just because it hasn't been my experience. I definitely had ET contact. So I do think it could be a mind manipulation. So the the government is blamed and not the ET connection. What do you think about well, that theory? No, that's not correct, because this secret space program, if you'll notice, and also this is true with the my labs, okay, all all the ladies that are friends, there's Misha Johnston, there's Denise Stoner, there's like four or five women, they're all friends with each other, they're all abductees, they're all my lab, they're all my labs. I and, like Misha. 
Wisconsin. Yeah. Okay, so in all my labs, a lot of them were uh, MK Ultra. Okay, but not all of them. Misha's MK Ultra. Okay, and she's also Secret Space Program. She's also my lab. Okay, but all these women are my labs, and they will tell you that um, when you get my lab, it's not the humans that are in charge; it's the aliens. Well, I agree with that, but you know, I, I don't think it's a government institution program, secret space program, developed by some um, secret portion of the government. It, no, without... it, no, no, it's not. It's not. Okay, so, all right, so you've got the Germans, right? So the Germans yeah. were in uh, in Antarctica, right? And mean, they're supposed to be the or the military. They're supposed to be the base down there, right? The, the alien base, right? Yeah. So they made contact, and according to some people, uh, 1952 flyovers over the pen, over the uh, the uh, DC was yeah. the Germans. Okay, and that's the reason why they didn't say hello because there was were Germans in those craft. Okay, not, uh, not aliens. From how? Where do you where do you get that information that they were Germans? Well, some I don't remember who said it, but. Uh, uh, I find it hard to believe. I mean, because they didn't. I don't think the Germans had that technology in '52. Well, the Germans were ahead of us in every technology that existed back then. They had every. They were ahead of us in the atom bomb. They were ahead of us in uh, most technologies, and they had uh, people like uh, Orsich, uh, Maria Orsich, that had that had they were using psychic powers to connect with the aliens and uh there's a reason why they were ahead of everybody it wasn't because that you know i don't think the german uh people were necessarily smarter than the americans or the japanese or anybody else they, they've got some big brains but i think they were ahead of us because of their connections with the ets not because they the, lost the war they lost the war yeah wow. but the only reason they lost that war is because we had a we had a secret uh, project where we went in and blew up their their nuclear stuff. If they, we hadn't done that, they they would have developed the nuclear bomb before us. They were ahead of us. Well, some people say. I mean, Linda Moulton House says World War II was really a war among East T races that humans played out. So we may have had. Our own ET races fighting the German ET races, you know. Well, we did because if you believe, uh, if you believe, uh, what's his face, the guy, um, um, he, he's like ninety-two. He died like ten, five, ten years ago. Uh, oh, you mean Mel Wills? What's his name? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think he's mentioned in my book. Actually, you would like my book. Making contact because you got a copy of it in, uh, near you. I could send you a. Um, no, no. Do you have a copy of it sitting near your body? I actually don't have a copy. I could pull it up on the screen, but no. I I'm in London now, and I sold all my copies. But um, that's okay. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, if you want, I'll if you send me a PDF, I'll read it and uh, interview you again, where we're focused more on your book. Well, well, I also want to go back to um, some of my experiences you were talking about because, you know, I think you do have insight into the whole um, situation on here. Go for it. And what happened to me was being abducted in 87 in western Nebraska. Then a couple of months later, uh, a little ET hybrid fetus was placed in my hands and I said this is weird and then after that I was floated out of a window I mean a lot of people have had a lot more exotic experiences than I have but I I um go through wrote, that experience what's that go through that experience uh yeah I'm driving cross-country 1987 with this girlfriend route 80 we're driving east from Oregon to the east coast and we're stopping North Platte Nebraska uh, after you know 12 hours it's one of those road trips and we pull off the road go down this little other little road down a little 
deserted road that a sign says enter at your own risk. And we parked by, I guess that was because of these irrigation canals that just flood sometimes. So we just parked there because we're really tired. And then it feels like we're frozen in the middle of the night. I mean, we pass out, we just go to sleep. And it's like we are suspended in time and space. And we wake up in the same position we go to bed in. And who even remembers that? I mean, I only remember, uh, but we we just thought that was so weird. It felt really creepy. And then I had a mark on the back of the, my leg, the back of my knee. It was a four prong puncture mark. And I only noticed it a day or two later, or someone else noticed it for me. And I, I said, what's that? And then I immediately flashed. I thought it must be a spider bite, but then, for some coincidental reason, I started to run into people from Bud Hopkins group, the intruder group in New York City. I asked one of them, what do you think that mark is? They said, oh, it's an abduction mark. And that just pulled me down the rabbit hole. And then I met Bud and uh, John Mack, Whitley Strieber, but Bud was really key as a friend. I mean, he was friends with a lot of people, but Bud really, um, uh, opened me up to the fact that, yeah, that probably was an abduction that's been going on and, 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 you know, Did that pressure. What's that? He didn't regress me, but I talked to him. No, he was busy at that point and I wasn't ready for a regression. It wasn't until like 20 years later that I had a regression and, or I met those beings. It wasn't, it's never as scary as you thought it was, but no. No, Bud was, I, we were friends. I didn't want to ask him for, uh, I mean, I didn't know him that well, but he was very, he was very nice and kind. And um, I interviewed him a couple of times for my cable show in Manhattan Cable. And uh, I would go to the Intruders Foundation, met um, uh, David Jacobs and John Mack and, and Whitley and him had already broken up at that point. So, um, uh, but anyway, uh, so about maybe it was six months after the abduction in Western um, Nebraska that this little creature was put into my hand um, in the middle of the night. I said, and I, I sort of woke up and I said, this is weird. So I, because I, I, I could not relate to it emotionally. It was, uh, so I'm sure it was a hybrid being, maybe it was a year after. So it was a hybrid being that was placed in my hand and, um, I just thought the whole thing was very strange. So that's sort of my experience. And then um, have vague flashes of memory about that. What do you make of that, Chief? Well, uh, I try not to to uh, judge people's experiences. Your experiences are valid unless yeah. you're making them up and you don't sound like you're making them up, so. No, no, I'm definitely not. I mean, I don't know what to make of them, I'm just, being as, um, but that whole thing in 87 sucked me, as I, as Grant Cameron says in my book, down the rabbit hole, and I became obsessed. You know, two things happen. You have this um, repulsion towards the act of the whole idea of contact, and you become obsessed. It's just like paradoxical emotion. You want to know everything, and you don't want to know anything. So, I mean, that's what I find in some people. So that really, so after that, I did every workshop, uh, you know, bought every, I must have hundreds of books from, you know, the original copy of Interrupted Journeys to all those books in the 50s, Flying Saucers Are Real, and to 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, 90s, uh, you know, John Mack's book, seeking out John Mack, doing interviews with John, and then, you know how it goes. There's so rising stuff. What was your next uh, interesting experience? So after the 87 abduction, 88, the little hybrid thing. Uh, well, hold on. Before, before you go on to your next one, go back to the one you were just talking about with the hybrid. Go through that experience. For people, there, people when I interview people, they tend to want to gloss through each experience. And I want, we want the details. Well, first, I think after the trip to um, Western Nebraska, finally getting back to New York, I think at some point it was in that summer that sperm had been extracted 
from my body. And it was later on in that summer, I wasn't even in my house. I was sleeping at my parents' house for some reason, which was more of a secluded area than the city. And I'm sleeping. And in the middle of the night, I guess it was, I feel this tickling or this like this furry thing on the inside of my thigh. It's like um, this creature was rubbing and and you and I don't know why they would do that, but you don't forget something rubbing the inside of your thigh when you're sleeping in the middle of the night. Sure, and, sure. and they, because I really didn't see any they, but uh, there was a presence. They did this three times, and each time they did it, the um, the object or the feeling got bigger. It was like it started smaller, and then it got eventually bigger, and then I sort of woke up or semi woke up and I was sitting there at the edge of my bed and I had my hands out and this little being it looked like a deer with big eyes I mean that's classic was placed in my hand I said to myself this is weird what is it I didn't see I felt the presence of other beings but I didn't actually see anybody but I did see the eyes of this little creature and it looked like it a deer what's that it looked like a deer it looked like a deer but some people say that screen memories for ets it looked like something it 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 was less wasn't an animal but it wasn't a human and i just thought this is weird what why am i being candid this i wasn't scared i was just kind of like this is so weird i didn't have any if it was a part of my genetics, I didn't have any connection at all with it. I just thought this was the, this is so weird. And then I went back to sleep, you know. Okay, I'll go to your next experience then. And then I think it was that same summer, I, or maybe it was before the little creature experience. I was still on Long Island and I had a dream I was floated out of a window through the glass and on a ship and I was walking around the ship. I saw this one guy at a computer being a, a human at a computer being very nervous. And then um, I saw another woman. She looked like she was all tied up or something struggling some way. But as I was walking around the ship, I kept putting my, my middle finger to my third eye and somehow the voice said, we can't work with you anymore, as if I was in too in control of my own, um, you know, motion by putting my finger up to my third eye, they could no longer work with me. And they were very polite about it. And um, I don't know if that was the last time I had contact in 88. But the strange thing was, I was on Long Island, and there was this unity, uh, like, celebration and I go and I never go to these things because I don't really not into that whole thing but I went and I saw the woman who I thought I saw on the ship at this event this sort of large overweight woman nothing like really special or interest just very ordinary but I saw her I I think and you know I don't know because it was vague dreamlike because it's a dream like to me when I've had these contacts. It's never in someone like Whitley, I feel is really, really present in his experience and so lucid. And I think that's key to the alien contact experience is being lucid in altered states of consciousness. I don't mean drug states, I mean dreamlike states where lucidity produces awareness. So anyway, as lucid as I was, I remembered seeing this woman. So I said to myself sort of, I'm going to talk to this one, but I can't come out and say, have you, were you aboard a ship? I mean, I thought that was too weird. I didn't know her at all. And she just, but I did go up to her and I said, okay, what am I going to say to her to see if, um, if that was the same woman? So, I, I mean, it was kind of not a big gathering, maybe 40, 50 people. So I go up to her and I, I just said, well, how are you doing? How are you? How 
how are you feeling? And what she said was not what I expected her to say. Oh, I had some weird dreams. She said to me, I feel better than I've ever felt in my life. And that's all she said to me. And I said, wow, it wasn't what I was expecting, but I think this was the woman. Does that make sense? Well, the very first guy that ever paid me to do a regression, uh, he, he wouldn't speak, right? Um, when I was not able to do a regression on him, I was up. I wasn't able to regress him at all. I could put him in trance, or I could help him put himself in trance. And I just read positive affirmations to him for four four sessions. At the end of the fourth session, I, I would walk him out to his car every time after the end of the session, and he wouldn't say a word. He literally would not say a single word. He would get into his car and go, and he wouldn't give me any feedback to see if, to tell me if it was working. So after the in the fourth at the end of the fourth session, I walked him out to his car and said, "You need to give me some feedback. I'm only charging you this small amount of money because I'm trying to figure out if this works." And he said, "I feel better about my life now than I've ever felt in my entire life, even though I'm still unemployed." It's the words that came out of his mouth, and I never saw him again after that. Well, that kind of just gives me a little chills and makes a confirmation that. I mean, I was pretty sure this is the same woman I had seen and saying that was like maybe there is some very positive um, energetic exchange that happens as an abduction. It's not just fear and trauma and genetic samplings. I think there's an upgrade that does happen. I feel like that happened to me, a kind of energetic vibrational upgrade of mind expansion many of the artists like the Allagash four all of their art you know the Fowler book the Allagash story right yeah um, those four artists each of those artists their 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 art became much more sophisticated complex and abstract they became better artists essentially and so there is an upgrade I feel and this is what Ray Hernandez talks about in the uh, Beyond UFOs book um, when in their S and their survey of 5,000 people, 85% feel initially there was some fear, right. but their lives were changed for the better. I have to say, this has set me on a path that I don't think I would have been an accountant or a lawyer, but it set me on a path where there's something about this whole phenomena that is the most mysterious, compelling, interesting thing to ever face humanity. And this is the same response I get from people like Whitley Strieber, Linda Moulton Howe, uh, Richard Dolan. There's something so... Um, so you realize that you can be upgraded by the dark side just like you can by the good side, right? Yeah, but you don't always feel good by the dark side and you don't always get an expansion and you don't always become more self. I mean, I don't think you do at all. I well, think uh, let me let me let me give you let me give you a story here real quick. Very short one. Dad, I just want to say Go ahead. Because my life has then been devoted to the up leveling the evolution of humanity, right. which shows me that's a positive experience, not for myself, but you can give me your story. Well, this isn't my story. This is this is somebody I knew a long time ago. Uh, she talked. Do you remember ICQ? Who? ICQ. Do you remember ICQ? Roxy Q. I C Q. I C Q. No, what is I C Q? Well, I C Q used to be the most downloaded piece of software on the planet. Okay, it was like uh, like um, anything. Anything you can think of now that's extremely popular to download. Everybody used ICQ. It was the first instant messaging application out there. Okay, so I used to talk to this lady over ICQ, and she said that she was abducted by aliens, and she was a bit of a Bible thumper, but she, she, um, she said they put a uh, hood over her head, and when... When she had this hood over her head, 
she said she could see very dark, uh, sort of malevolent images of things. And then when they took the, the hood off of her head, she was more psychic than before. So she could see the darkness much better than before they upgraded her. But she, I said, well, isn't that a good thing? And so she said, no, it's not. It's very frightening to see the, all the darkness. And when I did uh, ayahuasca several times, the same thing yeah. happened to me. I was opened up psychically like uh, a can of worms, and I could see all the dark things in this world that even psychics can't see. Even the good psychics you go to, they can't see these things because they're not that psychic. I'm a super psychic for two years. And then I finally closed back down. It's the worst two years of my life. Well, if you do like ego dissolvement where it's all a play of dark and light. Yeah. I think, you know, you may see like, you know, as a transcendent being, you are, um, you know, not affected by the dark or the light. So, I don't know, depends how much emotional traumas and emotional work you've had, because of course there's dark and of course there's light, but if you can stay in your center, then none of it has to affect you. Well, I have two attaching spirits, they're demonic. Both of them. I've had them my whole life. So, uh, how do you know they're not like there to help you? Well, I'm not saying they're not helping me, they're, but they're still demonic. Well, I mean, you could go into those dualities, but um, I try to. I, I mean, I I'm here to help uplift. That's my feeling, you know. I know what you, I know so, how you're saying. That's the reason why I'm talking to you, because I'm, well, I'm helping people uh, uh, know that anybody who watches my show will know that if they've watched enough of my episodes, that I'm, experience, I'm talking to experiencers and I'm expanding the general knowledge of aliens so that everybody can feel comfortable talking about the subject, whereas when I was young, None of us talked about the subject because everybody thought you crazy if you talked about the subject. And we've moved forward a lot. Right. But I think if you wanted to go get some clearings from people, there are people that do clear that stuff for you. Well, the, I have two choices. You see, uh, you know who June Lundgren, Lundgren is? Jim Lundgren, no. June. No. June. June Lundgren. No. Okay, she claims to be um, a reincarnation of, the, of uh, Ariel, one of the guardian angels of heaven. And she claims that uh, many, many, many years ago, she was pulling a demon out of somebody and as, as Ariel and killed the, uh, the person died. So God forced her to incarnate as a human 185 times. Okay, so what about it? Well, so the my point, okay, so that's a piece of it. So I know somebody who, she she says, all I got to do is send her a photo and she'll remove them. So I know somebody who can remove them. But here's the thing. I have had this dream for a long time where I would sit in a, in a chair facing an audience and there would be a... a, a a segment of the population of the audience who'd be on the side in a in a line waiting to come up and and check to, to see if you know just to test to see if what I was saying was real. And they would walk up behind me. There would be a guy standing at the head of the line. He'd have a watch and he would say, "You got one minute. Go." And they can walk up behind me. They stick their hand out, their arm out to the left of my head. I grab their arm. I put their hand on my head and they can feel one of the attaching spirits, the one that's sitting on my head. And this is all recorded live YouTube. And so if they actually feel what's on my head, they're going to react. 
and or they may not feel anything at all, depending on who they are. So if the, I figured if I did that over and over and over, then um, at some point mankind would come to an understanding that attaching spirits are real, not that they might be real, not that they possibly could be real, but they are real. I, I, I believe you, but do you want to get rid of it or do you want to, I mean, do you want to... I want to get rid of everybody's all together. But do you work on yourself first? Get rid of but if I if I get rid of mine, how am I going to prove that they exist? If you get rid of yours, you don't know where you're going to be. You're going to be in a much more elevated, enlightened state. It's not about proving anything. It's about being in an elevated place where you can lead people into a new place. You don't know. It's like it's like any type of habit. You get used to a certain thing, but this is just my suggestion. You could do whatever you want, but well, you I, have, I have a, I have a choice. I have two choices. I can either get rid of mine, or I can help the whole world get rid of theirs. You don't know if that you might be able to help people better by getting rid of yours, because there'll be one less in the world. So, I, 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 I would try getting my suggestion. Get rid of yours and see if your whole mentality, your whole thought form reality will shift and you might not even recognize yourself. That's my suggestion. Just try that way. Because the way you're doing it is not helping. I mean, maybe it's helping some people, but well, it ha you know. I haven't had the I haven't had that that uh, where the people come up behind me and put their hand on my head. I haven't had that that event yet. If I could just have one of those, maybe I'd feel comfortable letting go of it. Well, it doesn't take much to do something like that. Go to an expo, sit in a chair, go anywhere in public. I mean, you know, just it's gotta try be, it. It's got to be recorded for you. Yeah, it'll be recorded. Get, get a camera person, get it recorded, and boom, you have proof. But I don't think that's going to help people. I think getting rid of yours will help people a lot more. It's just my okay. feeling. Well, you have any other uh, encounters you've had with anything? Uh, let's see what else that, you know, after I started to be in control of myself and my own consciousness, um, I felt like they didn't really want to work with me anymore because they could not control, control me. Yeah. So I think that was really sort of like some of the, uh, last times that um but still i became obsessed with the subject and feel like you have a piece because of all these people you've talked to but i don't think anyone has all the pieces i've talked to you know all the people in government uh jim pedison from the renaldson forest and uh you know whitley streber i've hung out with a lot i mean everyone has a little linda moulton howe and that's my book is actually a collection of essays by all these great writers. No one really knows the full so you, scope of this phenomenon. So you understand from what Jim Peniston said from his encounter, what that means about the future? Do you remember what he said about what was in the crowd? What? No, what did he say? I don't remember that part. Tell me. Okay, so him and the the other sergeant that he was with together Burrow. on Burroughs. Yeah, so both of them got sucked into this craft separately. One of them was in the craft, then he got came back out. Then the other one was in the craft and came back out. And they they did they were in the craft separately. And one of the things he said was was no beings in the craft. What was in the craft was uh, a very advanced super computer type of, of uh, thing that wasn't physical but it was us from the future All that right. be that means that we merge with the uh, computers at some point yeah i think that's one possible scenario but why was that back then in 1980 what was the reason for coming back in time who knows? Uh, uh, 
you know, different people say different things about why beings come back uh, in time. The rumor about the uh, some of the greys is that you got the you got the greys that have been, the greys that are now, and the greys from the future, and they don't like each other, and they're the same race. They're the exact. We're talking about the exact same race, not not a different grey race, but the same race. The past, present, and future ones don't like each other at all. And the future ones are so more evolved than the present ones who are so more evolved than the past ones. And so even within a single race, you got, you know, like future humans might not like us at all, you know. Uh, yeah, but, you know, it's all about transcending the form itself. The beings that are attached with you, the greys, the ETs, the, the uh, you know, the Buddhas, the Christians, all that. It's about transcending it all and coming to another level where you can look down on the dramas of this 3D world that include ETs and say, yeah, they're just playing out a game of chess and from that higher realm it's not it's not to be taken seriously you know that's part that's one way and also the other thing what you're saying and i don't doubt it's true for the people that are saying it no one really has the whole end all we have are pieces and right, snippets right, right. I, got it. I got it. different experiences we don't have the whole truth we might get more truth when the government rolls out the bodies and the craft or, or, you know, I think we all, what John Mack said was, which I think is the most true, we need to know in different ways. We need other ways of knowing. We need to develop our imaginal consciousness, the, the realm of the subtle. We need to transcend the realities that have trapped us and understand the bigger picture from a whole different point of view because it, it will never make sense on the level of stories and logic and all the ways humans think about reality it doesn't make sense we don't we we don't have the capacity to understand or we need to rise to the case and my book is a very positive view maybe you won't like maybe you'll like it about who we can be if we just allow um, these experiences to pull us beyond our old humanity. I think, you know, humans are very dangerous creatures. Oh, they Look are. They've done. They yeah. are. Um, I think the whole scenario is God. Uh, uh, there's two phrases at the beginning of my unpublished book. They are Hugh Elahi Elahu. And Om Tat Sat Om. Both phrases mean God exists, nothing exists except God. So if you look at uh, us as being an aspect of God that chose to be on this primitive level, and we can choose to go up to another level and another level and another level, but in the end, we're all just playing games and feeding our existences, positive and negative, back into the totality which is God, which is the, to, all of it. And, you know, I look at it like um, like the way that there's uh, some, there's a book called Samadhi and Siddhi. I've got it on my shelf if you want to see it. Mm -hmm. It's This guy says, at the highest level of, of reality, just before you go back permanently into the light, you realize that you're the, uh, the seer, the scene, and the all of it. You're you're at the center of the universe. You're the yeah. whole universe. You're you're everything. You're all of it. Yeah, exactly. That's what I think is the ultimate answer. And you know, ETs and humans and reality—they're all in a way entertaining. But it's it as as an as an intellectual challenge to civilization. I think it's the most fascinating thing we could think about. It is. Do you have any other interesting stories to tell them? Well, I, I go soon because it's getting late here. Okay. Uh, 
I think, you know, being in the UFO field, going to things like Contact in the Desert, these are very intelligent people looking into this subject. These are not just tinfoil hat people. Oh, I know. Looking... I know. I know. I know, know, but people on the outside don't realize the intelligence of people like Richard Dolenz or or Linda Moulton Howe. These are sincere and John Mack, right? Did you ever meet John well, Mack? You you can you can listen to Whitley talk and you can tell he's intelligent because he, he stops and thinks about it. every every time you ask him a question, he thinks about it. He doesn't just spit out an answer. Whitley's probably the best writer in the whole field. And so what this is that's doing. Cause, that's because he, he was a writer long before he realized he was a contactee. That's his job. Right. So he's a real skilled craftsman of communication. Yes. He is, he's sense. an artist. He's a, he's a literary artist. He is. And his, his books are very... Um, complex means of communication but I'm just saying in general the phenomena whatever this phenomena turns out to be is basically here to upgrade our intelligence our our conception of reality our idea of ourselves uh, expand our human potential this is the point of view I take I mean there's other people saying no they're here to take over all that well that's who, who cares and who knows? What it's doing for me and the people I admire is is expanding the possibilities about the nature of reality. And, 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 and that's why my book is called Making Contact, Preparing for the New Realities of Extraterrestrial Existence. The preparation is in the expansion of the mind and getting out of dualistic thought, black, white, up, down, yes, no. The... the, the, the the cosmos is far vaster, more complex, multi-layered, multi-dimensional. Um, sure. It, it gives us an opportunity to expand our mind beyond the dumbing down of religion and politics and media and education and culture. Terence McKenna says culture is not your friend. All these things that keep us in boxes, we have an opportunity if we explore this phenomena to go beyond anything that's been previously conceived and allow ourselves to expand into the unknown. That's really what it comes down to, making known the unknown, which is our destiny as human beings, as, as beings, as, as incarnational uh, existence is to make known the unknown. So <laughs> which, which aliens did you have, do you have contact, have you had Direct contact with which type? I've never seen. You never saw them. I've never. I've only felt them. Okay, uh, that's fine. The, that's fine. I, I'll take that answer. That's good. But the ones that I, I, I should go soon. The ones that Kamara Jones draws on uh, Art Soldier seventy seven on Instagram. They're basically big heads and eyes with no no nose and no mouth. When I first saw them, it was like, oh yeah. That's sort of something like what they look like. So it's pure telepathic thought. I mean, and so. So what do you uh, think about reptilians? I never had an experience, so. Um, but do you, you know, some people say that they uh, control the planet. How do you feel about that? Right. There's just a train coming by. You said some people say they're what? Controlling the planet. I mean, some people say a lot of things. Some people say it's all controlled by ETs. I definitely think there's a matrix of limitation and um, and lack of of creativity that most people humans inhabit. There are some geniuses that break through that matrix and create incredible things, maybe on the help of higher ETs, but uh, you can make up any story you want about this, uh, Mike. Um, so you don't, in other words, uh, okay, so Whitley was with greys and little blue beings. You were with uh, something else. 
and uh, but with Greys, I mean, Greys really creeped me out. Yeah, I may have been with them, but but the idea is it comes back to the individual and whatever it is that confronts you. How are you evolving from the situation, whether they're Greys or humans or the guy at the local store or, you know, uh, uh, meeting a new friend? I mean, all of it. It's about um, evolution, evolution of experience and expansion of feelings beyond emotionality. How do we feel more? How do we add to creation as creators? My whole thing is like, how do we become artists of creation? And maybe for you, it's doing this podcast. Maybe for someone else, it's dancing or singing. Any way you do it, we're expanding upon possibility. And I think that's the reason for incarnation. And yes, we're at the edge, we're at the threshold of a new time where new possibilities that have transcended the old dualities are now at our doorstep and it's showing up for some people as alien, some people as reptilian, whatever it's showing up, we're about to take a, take a leap into an unknown future that will, does not look like anything the past does or anything we can actually conceive of. If you think you know it, it's already old. The uh, unknown, yeah. No, I don't, I don't know. I don't it's know. In I don't know. A, into what I call my program, New Realities on YouTube. It's in, we are at the very, very threshold of new realities that are about to blow our minds to something we have not yet to conceive of. That's just my feeling. Well, is there anything you want to say to the audience before we leave the, uh, in the show? Well, I think we're all here to, to step into something we have yet to consider. I think if we're each challenged every moment to take the old ways we've been like even walking to work, try a new avenue, try a new path, try, try on a new piece of clothing, try something new because the newness this is Joe Dispenza, of course, is now famous for doing this. Try a new neural net of reality, expand your thought, try to believe, as Lewis Carroll said, six impossible things before breakfast, you know? So try on the impossible. And that's why the UFO experience and all the people you talk to are so incredible because it challenges people's limited viewpoint because that limitation is a false um, sense that had been programmed into them by the matrix, by the reptilians, whoever it was. And now it's time to expand. That's where we're at. We're at the threshold of something new. And open your eyes because it's coming. Look at the sky because it's landing. Uh, look in because it's it's actuating a sense of a new being emerging in each side. Each one of us is becoming that new being. So these are not here we come. So what is the name of your book, new book again? It's called Making Contact, the Preparing for the New Realities of Extraterrestrial Existence. I do interviews about the subjects of um, changing perception, how to cognize. You know the difference between cognition and recognition? Uh, recognition is when you uh, see something and you, it looks similar to something you're aware of already. And cognition is... Uh, just a state of being, isn't it? Yeah, cognition and re to recognize something means to recognize it. So you're right. You have had to have cognized the thing itself in order to recognize it. So ETs, whatever they are, are unrecognizable because we have yet to cognize the essence of what it is that was really going on. So we can't recognize it because we have yet to form a cognition. So we're getting all these little pieces. It's like parts of the elephant, you know, the blind man and the elephant. This one's 
a rope. This one's um, a fan. So we're seeing all these different pieces, but we have yet to cognize the gestalt of the phenomena. So it has yet to be recognized, but we're getting closer to putting all those pieces together. So your program, everything, um, everything everyone's doing in the field is forming the jigsaw puzzle that one day will say, yes, of course, we knew it all along. And that's where I think we're on the threshold of becoming, becoming something unknown and unknowable and well, yet to if, be recognized. If you uh, have any guests on your show that want to be on my show, by all means, give them my contact information. And uh, I will uh, see you in the future as a client uh, or as a uh, on your show or however you wish to uh, continue. No, no. I, uh, you come on my show, I'll interview you about your experiences. Where are you located now? Uh, remember, remember I told you Sandy Springs. Oh, right. Sandy Springs, George. John Martin. Right, right, right. right. Well, yeah, you'd be a good guest. I do roundtable discussions with different abductees. Um, I think it would be good to have you on. So, um, Let's see. Let's see how this goes. I'm traveling for another month or two, um, but um, sometime so, in the fall, maybe. What What are you focusing on in your in your uh, presentations these days? You're, you're basically what your book is about, right? Well, no, I'm going beyond my book now. My next my next series of presentations is like sort of what Jacques Vallée said. If I found find out that these ETs are just visitors from another planet, I'll be very disappointed. There's a multi-dimensional aspect to sure. the phenomenon. Sure. And, but we have to develop the capacity to be multi-dimensional. So I'm teaching remote viewing. I'm talking about the non-local mind. This is what I'm focusing on in my next set of writings, how to become the all-wise knowing intelligence, the multi-dimensional being, the non-local consciousness. So, you know, and, and looking at talking to people like the Hal Putoff and Russell Targ and, and a new Ingo Swan. So I'm looking at that whole aspect of that we are infinite beings. And um, I think that's the most exciting part of this field. How's that sound? Well, I tried remote viewing when I, uh, when Ed Dames first released the very first video in his series about remote viewing. And yeah. uh, I could do the basic part of it, but I never got beyond the basic piece of it. It takes practice. It's like playing the piano. Anyone can play the piano and take a picture, but you have to practice. Re I know because I've seen people who practice it. You actually, and Gary Nolan has shown this, you actually develop a, 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 a denser part of the, of the um, what is it, the hypothalamus, the fudic and the codic. And there's parts of the brain, the more you remote view, the more ability you have to it. So yeah, people have a basic um, ability, but you have to play the, you have to practice, practice, practice to get well, really good. The experts that I've listened to say that, uh, who taught it back, you know, 10, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and are teaching it, are still teaching it today. Uh, the, what I heard was that, that, um, that they're the people are learning the same exact to get to the same exact level they're getting to that level much faster than they did 10 20 30 years ago yeah that's the collective mind the, the morphogenetic field is increasing its ability to be non-local and that's the hundredth monkey effect yeah so you have to and people are developing it it's in you know like 20 years ago, hardly anyone heard about it. Now you Google remote viewing, and you get millions and millions of websites that mention it. So it's in the field, it's in the awareness. I mean, how Porter, Russell Targ, Ingo Swan, they did an incredible job, of course, with the CIA, your old friends, the CIA, to really develop a protocol and a program that allows anyone, and I was just talking to small Paul Smith recently, who's a really great, fantastic remote viewer, to develop a practice of protocols that allow them to drop into the non-local mind in a precise and precision way. So there's techniques you can 
do that will make you a better remote viewer. Look, take Lynn Buchanan's class about CRV, controlled remote viewing, and you will develop a skill and levels and levels. So, yeah. He's, uh, I don't know if somebody's controlling him or what, but he's, uh, you know, when I he picked up the phone, I called him. He had the phone on, but he didn't say anything. And there, he's got some kind of problem with his local carriers. He must be out in the middle of nowhere. And I think he's in the middle of New Mexico somewhere. Yeah. But, I don't, but anyway, I should go soon. But this has been really interesting. I appreciate it. Let, 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 let me stop the recording, okay? Since you got to go. Let me stop the recording. Hold on.